Hello, everybody. Welcome to our broadcast today. I'm Pastor Steve Green. My wife, Penny, and I pastor here at Bretton Ward of Faith Church. Today is Sunday, July 24th. Again, thank you for joining us. We're thrilled to have you with us. We are thrilled to be studying the Word of God, and we're especially thrilled to be uh, looking at this subject that we are uh, studying here. It is uh, Matthew 5, the beginning of the teaching of Jesus in the New Testament. It's this passage of Scripture, sometimes called the Beatitudes. It's eight or nine different verses uh, in which Jesus lays out the program in which he describes for us. If we read it and understand it, then uh, we understand what the whole New Testament is about right from the very beginning. That's how he designed it. That's his intention in this passage is so that we would get the big picture right from the very beginning. And so it's all about being blessed, as um, you are aware, uh, if you've been following us in recent weeks. And in these, um, I say eight or nine verses, because there's really eight different steps that Jesus is describing here, eight different statements he makes. Uh, each statement is like a, a, the next tread on a stairway we're climbing up, and you need to take one step before you take the next step. And there's eight of them. Uh, you could say there's nine because the eighth one is repeated, but they all start with the word blessed. So uh, very clearly, very uh, almost dramatically, uh, we can see that it's God's will for us to be blessed. Um, and not only that though, but that, this, but that this blessing happens in the context of relationship, of covenant relationship. It, it isn't something that, um, that we can just snap our fingers and it all happens. Um, but it's something that uh, unfolds as we progressively participate in a covenant relationship with God. And this is all described in these eight steps that we have here at the beginning of Matthew. I find this to be such a beautiful thing that at the very, that the Bible would uh, be laid out so intelligently that it would make so much sense that this is the first teaching of Jesus in the New Testament. The first uh, four chapters of Matthew are setting the stage. And so here at the beginning of chapter five is when Jesus uh, really begins to teach. And so let, let's read uh, the first few of these statements. These are ones that we've covered in the previous weeks. Matthew 5, verses 3 to 7, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. And today we're going to study, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. So a good way of describing what it is that this message is about, what we're aiming for, uh, what the um, objective is, is that in this perilous world in which we live, um, we want for God to wipe away every fear that we have. That would be one good way of putting it. And it's entirely possible that we can live free from fear. David said in the 23rd Psalm, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. So this is obviously something that God has prepared for us. He wishes it for us, and it's something that we can lay hold of. Uh, another way of putting it would be to say that we would live a blessed life. And of course, that fits very well with what we just read, because again, each scripture begins with the word blessed. So God wants us to live a blessed life. So this passage, the verses we just read, um, plus uh, the few following verses, um, it's the message that Jesus preached everywhere. It's called the gospel of the kingdom. It's how to live in the kingdom of heaven. It's a message of repentance and the good consequences that follow repentance. Um, it's how to be righteous, how to be blessed. It's the way of life. It is the narrow road that few find. It is faith in God at its most basic. This is our, our most fundamental understanding of what faith is. It's how to walk in the Spirit, how to be led by the Spirit, how to live the life of God, how to enjoy 
our salvation, how to live free from the curse of the law. This is describing the authentic spiritual approach to life. Um, so just to review very quickly uh, what we've covered in previous weeks, um, again, there's a sequence to each of these verses. There are steps, and we take one step at a time, and we build upon the previous step. And the ability uh, to desire to be merciful, the ability to be merciful, and the desire to be merciful comes from engaging in the first four steps. Blessed are the merciful is the fifth step. So the first step is being poor in spirit, which is acknowledging that we are incapable in ourselves, in our own ability of being right. So clearly we need help. The second step is grieving that condition, understanding that this is not um, some, you know, vague, possibly irrelevant, spiritual, whatever uh, stuff <laughs> that most people don't understand and it doesn't matter anyway. Um, this, is, this is the stuff of life. It's how life works. And, and if we're incapable of being righteous, then there's going to be consequences. There's going to be daily consequences. There's going to be big um, consequences and little ones. And, and none of them are good if we are <clears throat> not being righteous. And so uh, the second step is to, to see that, to recognize it, to realize it's, realize it's our personal responsibility, pardon me, and to grieve that, to, to understand this is not okay, this is not acceptable, this is a negative impact. It's a neg negative impact on me and on those that I love, and there has to be a change. Uh, this is laying the groundwork for real, significant, positive, supernatural change in our life. So that's the second one. The third one is being meek. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And meek means teachable. It's being willing to accept without dispute uh, all of God's dealings with us. It means that we yield, surrender, submit, humble ourselves, that we release control to Him for the cause of righteousness. And then the fourth step follows upon the first three is that we're going to hunger and thirst for righteousness. As we follow the first three steps, we are going to need it. We're going to want it. It's not going to be a matter of duty that we need to investigate and pursue righteousness. It's, it's what we will hunger and thirst for. And so uh, God is very much engaged in this. This is supernatural. This is not something that we can do naturally. It's uh, what Jesus is doing is, to descri is describing to us how from the heart we can connect with a supernatural process that produces supernatural results. So all of these steps, uh, as we just said, are learning to live by the Spirit, learning to live supernaturally as opposed to our natural ability. Now, each of these steps is a step deeper into blessing, but it is very, I think, appropriate and helpful, helpful for us to recognize that each one of these steps also has the potential for offense. We can be offended. Jesus said, blessed are those who are not offended by me. Um, as we can see, being poor in spirit, while we... Uh, it's not hard to imagine that some would not want to admit that, that uh, needing to grieve, uh, particularly if a person hasn't seen anything wrong with how they're living, what they're doing, they're just fine, they're no, no worse than anybody else. Um, you know, they're just a regular person trying hard and then to find out that, well, no, this is not good enough. And, and it, A, it's not good enough. B, it has consequences. And C, it's your responsibility. Um, again, it's not hard to imagine where there could be offense in that. Needing to be meek, needing to uh, yield our life to the Lord, to follow His agenda, not ours, to humble ourselves, to lose our soul, as Jesus said. He said, if you lose your soul, you will gain it. That means that, that if we surrender our agenda to God, He will fill it with good things. If we cling to our own agenda, we will um, gradually starve spiritually. Um, and so, Again, that's our choice though. We can choose to be offended or we can choose to be blessed. And obviously, you know, one is, a, one is an excellent choice and it's the one that we make. So <clears throat> let's come to the, in particular, the one that we're studying today, which is blessed are the merciful, uh, for they shall obtain mercy. So 
uh, the, the New Testament times in which the Bible was written, uh, these were times of a uh, great transition, uh, a transition from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant. Uh, covenant and Testament are, are words that are identical. So when we say Old Covenant, New Covenant, it's the same as saying Old Testament, New Testament. And uh, there's a transition happening. And this transition is for many confusing. Um, and, and there were numerous questions associated with it. And so the writers of the New Testament, when we see this angle, a uh, way of reading the New Testament, it makes sense. Things fit very nicely, very perfectly. The, the writers are, uh, in book after book, are endeavoring to explain this transition from old to new. And so um, let's observe this, first of all, from Matthew 5, 7, when it says, Blessed are the merciful. Uh, that is the word uh, merciful is the Greek word eliemon, um, which um, occurs just a couple of times in the Bible. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Uh, and so these are what merciful. Um, Merciful and mercy, obviously, we can see clearly in English, these are um, words from the same word family. It's also true in Greek. We have eliemon and elieo, the same word family. Um, sometimes the distinction is one's a noun, one's a verb, one's an adjective, things like that. But they're words that um, essentially mean the same thing. So, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Now, let's go back to the Old Testament and get a little bit of Old Testament context here. Uh, in Micah chapter 6, we're going to read from two separate prophets in the Old Testament. And what these prophets are talking about is what God really wants. And really these words are prophetic of a future day. And that future day is when Jesus comes because he's the one that makes these things possible. Uh, again, as we've been emphasizing, this is supernatural. None of what we're talking about is something that you can do just because you're a human being and you have a brain and you can try hard. It, it, all of it requires a connection with heaven which happens in our heart and, and again often it's called faith. A uh, good word to describe what it is. Micah 6 verses 6 to 8, With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings? So these are rhetorical questions he's going to be asking and, and, um, and of course it, Question after question, the answer is going to be no. Uh, shall I come with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Um, he's asking, what is it that God wants? What's he going to be pleased with? What's going to make things okay between me and him? Then in verse 8, he has shown you, O man, what is good. And, and what does the Lord require of you but two, three things, to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. And so um, this is a profound thing because there are many, many of the commandments uh, that God gave Moses on Mount Sinai that have to do with the temple, temple worship, uh, sacrifices, offerings, you know, many ritual procedures. Um, but here he's saying really none of this is what God really wants. He wants you from your heart simply to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. That would be a way of putting it. What an amazing statement of what life is all about and buried deep in the Old Testament. A similar passage from the prophet Hosea, also chapter 6 and verse 6. Uh, it's, a, it's a parallel statement. Um, this prophet says, For I desire mercy. This is God speaking, of course. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. So again, it isn't just saying that God wants these things. He's saying this is what He wants, and this is really what He doesn't want. Um, <clears throat> and so these things are from the heart. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, not sacrifice, not the old covenant, not the old covenant system, but a new covenant system. Again, these statements are prophetic. Uh, a new covenant in which um, God puts His laws in our hearts and in our minds and, and we become merciful people uh, by the presence and power of God within us and His Word in our heart. 
this is what God has always been aiming for. And so now, let's come to the, well, first of all, before I say <laughs> and now, let's also observe that mercy is front and center in this. This is what he wants. He wants mercy from us. He wants us to be merciful people. That, in God's eyes, is what the win is. That's the win that he's going for. Of course, the verse that's our main verse today is Matthew 5, 7, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. So now, moving into the New Testament, Jesus uses um, one of these Old Testament uh, statements in order to highlight uh, what he's about and this transition. Again, we said that the New Testament writers are constantly on about this transition. Uh, and so Jesus is addressing it here. And uh, he says in Matthew 9, verses 11 to 13, And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? According to the law, um, the old covenant way of doing things, this is not good. You do not do this. You do not eat with tax collectors and sinners. And when Jesus heard that, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Then in verse 13, but go and learn what this means. And now he quotes from Hosea chapter 6 and verse 6. So he's telling the Pharisees, um, go <laughs> into, you know, these Pharisees were the experts. They were the ones that more than anybody um, made a, a big deal of studying and knowing the Old Testament scriptures. And Jesus said to him, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So the earthly ministry of Jesus marked, again, marked the transition from the old covenant to the new covenant. And Jesus is using this verse as a way of expressing that. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. The sacrifice being typical of the old covenant. Mercy is a word that he's using to be typical of the New Testament. Um, this is one of those occasions again, which we mention somewhat regularly, that where, where big thoughts, big ideas, the whole, sometimes the whole expanse of the New Testament, how it gets reduced down to simple statements, short statements, sometimes a single word. And in this case, the single word is mercy. Jesus is using the word mercy as found in Hosea chapter 6 and verse 6 to, to express the intent of the whole New covenant. Everything that follows upon his arrival on the earth, his crucifixion, his resurrection, it's all for the cause of uh, producing mercy in the hearts of those who follow him. Um, one reason Jesus mentions here that mercy is important, there's more than one reason, but one reason is that Jesus wants to connect with sinners. That's why he's eating with tax collectors and with sinners is because he's, not because he's going to be like them, but because he wants to reach them. He wants to touch them. He is merciful toward them. This is a new covenant, not where these people are ignored and shunned and neglected, but rather where um, he is reaching out to them. He desires mercy and not sacrifice. And so the reason we're looking at this is because it is highlighting what mercy means, the importance of it. Um, it's the big idea would be a way of putting it. Um, uh, and, and, you know, um, <clears throat> I can recall... I, can, I don't recall exactly when it is, but I have a clear memory of where I was and what it was like when it first dawned on me in a clear way that compassion, and, and we mentioned the Greek words here that are behind the word mercy and merciful, um, but the, uh, these words are sometimes also translated compassion. To be compassionate, to be merciful is the same idea, just different words expressing the same thing. And so at this time I was thinking uh, more of the word compassion as opposed to the word merciful, but again, they mean the same thing. Um, but it dawned on me that uh, I used to think that compassion was for the helpless, those who couldn't help themselves, those who were uh, unfortunate and, and were beyond their own help. Um, 
and, and these would be people deserving of and needful of compassion. And, and that's true, certainly what I thought was true, and yet something that I really didn't have a good grip on was the fact that compassion is also necessary for those who aren't helpless, but they're still making bad decisions. Uh, sometimes they're difficult people, sometimes they're um, adversarial, um, uh, just um, being troublesome and hard to say why, but nevertheless, uh, there's conflict there. And, uh, and it dawned on me that, that, that people are, that are doing this are in trouble. They are not walking in love. They are not being obedient to the scriptures. They are um, really opposed to God and opposed to themselves and opposed to their own best interest. And therefore, it takes more grace, it takes more love, it takes more mercy. Um, but they are needful of our mercy, just like the people who um, are helpless are needed also. And so, uh, <clears throat> compassion or mercy. Mercy is for all the people that we know. If you're married, it's for your spouse. If you're a parent, it's for your children. If, if, it is, uh, if you're a child, it's for your parents. If you have a job, it's for your co-workers. It's for your friends. It's for your fellow church members. Um, mercy is the way of living. It is the true heart flow um, that God builds inside of us. Let's read um, Matthew 12, verses 1 to 2. Again, we, we just read uh, Matthew 9, 11 to 13, and we saw Jesus quote Hosea 6, 6, uh, um, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Um, interestingly, he quotes it again. So Matthew makes a double reference to this. In other words, it's a big deal. This, this, um, this verse, this Old Testament verse, and the fact that Jesus quoted it in different contexts um, is very useful to Master, Master, very useful to Matthew as he is being led by the Spirit, inspired to, to write this gospel in Matthew 12, and we'll just read verses 1 to 2 and then verses 7 to 8. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. It's, it's, this is one of those Sabbath day stories. And his disciples were hungry and began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, to Jesus, look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. And so they took Obviously, they took exception to this. Now, in verse 7, um, and, and if you're interested in the intervening verses, by all means, go and read them. But we're um, just getting right to our point here. But if you had known, Jesus speaking, but if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would have not, you would not have condemned the guiltless, for the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. So again, um, just as with Jesus eating with the tax collectors and sinners, he uses that as an occasion to highlight the transition from old to new. And, and, and again he does. He's marking this transition. In the old covenant, the Sabbath was one day a week. But now in the new covenant, which hasn't been ratified yet, it will be when Jesus sheds, sheds his blood, but in the new uh, covenant, the Sabbath will be seven days a week. In the old covenant, it was abstaining from physical work on that one day. In, in the new covenant, it is abstaining from doing things Things that God intends us to do um, by faith, by the Spirit, uh, it's abstaining from doing those things by our flesh. It's the work of the flesh when what really is necessary is the work of the Spirit. And so we learn to rest from those things. Can you truly live life this way? Can you be responsible? Can you be properly engaged? Can you do everything you do and, and at the same time be conscious of doing things spiritually as opposed to naturally? Can you truly rest from from the, the labors of the flesh. Now, we have to be careful how we say this. We're, we're always going to work. We're always going to need to use our body to work. We will be tired from working. None of these things are wrong. But, but, um, but uh, in, involved with this is, are we learning to do the necessary things um, 
by the Spirit, by necessary things, I mean things where God has given us a spiritual way of doing it. And so in that sense, it's not like we're not working anymore, or we never get tired anymore, but, it's, but we are learning to rest from uh, the fruitless ways of trying to approach life on our own human terms, as opposed to approaching it spiritually. And of course, that would be seven days a week, 24 hours a day. Um, that is the Sabbath now. It's entering into His rest. Praise God. And so the Old Testament Sabbath was just kind of a shadow. It was a type and shadow. It was just a, a vague reference to a much more glorious thing that was to come in the future. Um, so he said, if you, if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. Um, so the law, he condemned, the Pharisees condemned the disciples. Law empowered by flesh, it ends in condemnation. Mercy, again, is a way of describing this whole transition. And so again, this one little word is being used to, to portray a very big idea, to give us very quickly, very clearly, a, a picture of where it is we're going, what this is all about, what God is asking of us. Just like we read back in Micah chapter 6, verses 6 to 8, what is it that God wants from you? He wants you uh, to be merciful. There it is. Um, so m mercy, as we continue to read in the New Testament, is priority number one. Um, the word mercy um, is, or the, or the idea of love, is very consistent with, perhaps identical to righteousness, to, be, to behave righteously, to, to love people, to be merciful. These are all the same idea. So we read in Matthew 6, 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. This is priority number one, his righteousness, which would again would be loving people. Um, and not only that, this verse, I love this verse because it makes that critical point very clear, but two, it also makes clear that good things, things that we can highly value, things like having all necessary material things added to us, that is a product of putting righteousness first, of learning to live righteously. Praise the Lord. This is again the new covenant way. Uh, so let's also look, uh, and what we're looking at here for the next few minutes is, um, is how this priority of mercy continues to be emphasized in the New Testament. We, we've seen where in a prophetic way it was emphasized in the Old Testament, and we'll see New Testament verses where it is priority one, not even second or third most important, but the most important thing in our life, the thing that more than anything else impacts the outcome of our life. Um, we read it in Matthew 6, 33, seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. Now we're reading in Galatians 5, verses 5 to 6 in the New King James it reads, For we through the Spirit eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. We'll read this in the Amplified and I believe it's, it's clearer in the Amplified. Uh, verse 6, still though in the New King James, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. So reading it in the Amplified, For we um, not relying on the law, but through the Holy Spirit's help, by faith, uh, we wait for, we anticipate and wait for the blessing and good uh, which our righteousness and right standing, uh, for which our righteousness and right standing with God causes us to hope. So in other words, uh, what he's saying here is our righteous lifestyle, our loving lifestyle is going to give us confidence uh, that there is good coming for us. We're sowing the right things. We're going to reap the right things. And so there's a hope. There's an expectation of good. And it's based upon righteousness. It's based upon the fact that we are embracing um, this number one priority. In verse 6, For if we are in Christ Jesus, neither uncircumcision, um, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith. Um, and so he's saying this is the only thing that counts. Uh, only faith, activated, energized, and expressed, 
and working through love. Or as it says in the New International Version, the only, just <laughs> the, the, the Amplified does a good job of explaining it, but it does it with more words. Here in the NIV, it's just, it's just very brief and plain. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. And so the point that we're making right now is that verse matches very closely with Matthew 6.33, because Matthew 6.33 said, seek first, and, and here it is saying the only thing that counts. And, and although the wording is different, they are saying it's the same thing. So there's a clear presentation of what the number one priority is, and that is faith expressing itself through love. Um, all right, what we'll do is go to a final passage and then we'll be done for today uh, and this will be a third uh, passage that emphasizes this number one priority using clear language uh, as we've seen already you know seek first the only thing that counts now philippians 3 verses uh, 8 to 9 and then 13 to 14 and then again as before if you're interested in the other verses or why am I leaving some verses out, well, it's just to be quick and to the point. And, and I encourage you to look at the whole thing. But it's beginning in verse 8 of Philippians 3. Paul says, Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. And really he's speaking of things here by which he attained a sense of righteousness and, and value as a human being, um, but they were simply through his own human efforts, through natural things. Um, and he's learned to discount those things um, as a means of righteousness. And in verse 9 he says, And be found in him not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. And so the only true source of a sense of righteousness in us is the righteousness which comes by faith in Christ. In particular, he's referring to uh, trusting in in and being obedient to the words of Jesus, relying upon Jesus and what he said. In verse 13, brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, meaning that uh, although Paul is giving this first priority in his life, he has not perfected um, this life. And in fact, we all understand that we go to our grave not having yet perfected it. And yet this is the, um, even though we never ultimately uh, uh, get this down uh, in a perfect way. Um, nevertheless, to pursue this perfection is the highest and best and in fact necessary lifelong ambition for us. This is again the number one priority. So he says, brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but then he says, but one thing I do. And there it is again, just like seek first, just like the only thing that counts. And here he says, one thing I do, one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward. So it's the pressing toward is the one thing he does. The, the forgetting those things that are behind, reaching forward, those are involved with it, but the but the, the key point is this one thing he does is he presses toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And what that is, is this righteousness that he re referred to in the earlier verses. Uh, which again, as we saw in Galatians 5, to be righteous, to love people, it's the same thing. So, again... Righteousness or love is the one thing we do that has meaning. And so today what we've done is we've read the verse, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. And we've looked at, from the Old Testament, prophetic of the New Testament, that, that this is what God wants. He doesn't want, you know, thousands of rivers of oil or whatever that a person might sacrifice to Him as grand and uh, as it might be. But He simply wants us to, to love people. And we see that priority in Old Testament prophecy. And then in the New Testament, in, in three separate scriptures, again, we see this is the number one priority that you and I would be a lover of people, that we would find, that we would um, 
find woven into that we would ensure that we weave into the fabric of our daily life and we're busy going coming doing this that a hundred things but in all of it we can weave into that fabric of our life the the primacy the first priority of loving other people thank you for joining us today for being part of our family our church family our spiritual home uh, thank you for helping to build that home with us, and we look forward to seeing you the next time. Bye-bye.